I'd like to talk to you a bit about laughter, largely because they're not letting me talk about it in all the time for the Christmas lectures, so let me get this off my chest. I want to talk about the science of laughter, and I want to try and convince you that there, there could be a science of laughter, that we can take laughter seriously, scientifically. I've got to say, this isn't always a view widely shared by my community, so I'm going to try, I'm going to try and bring this alive for you by telling you a real story where laughter, and thinking about laughter scientifically, really helped me. So a couple of years ago, I was watching across Ipswich Railway Station, and I was doing this in the right way, as far as I'm concerned, because I was leaving Felixstowe, going through Ipswich, going to London. Okay, so that's my happy trajectory, is one of going home. I've got my son with me. We've been seeing his uh, grandma over in Felixstowe. His, um, so I'm walking along, and I feel a tap on my shoulder. I look up. There is no one there. But then I hear gales of laughter mysteriously coming from this side. Now, this is very complicated, and if you don't follow this joke, the rest isn't going to make any sense, so really pay attention. <laughs> what had happened was a teenage boy had come up to me, and he had leant round me like this, and he tapped me on the shoulder, but he was actually on this side. <laughs> so I looked that way, and he was actually here. This is hilarious. And then, <laughs> so, like, one minute, I'm perfectly happy going home, and now there are a group of teenage boys laughing at me because I looked the wrong way. And you think, oh, this is an interesting situation, isn't it, scientifically? What's going on here? Well, let's take a think about it. What can science tell us? If we look at the scientific literature on laughter, it is absolutely dwarfed by what we know about other emotions. So if I just put the terms into web of science, uh, emotion and fear, I get back 8,725 papers. If I repeat that with emotion and laughter, I get back 379. And that's all papers ever. Most of those are descriptions of patients in which the laughter is pathological, and I don't think that's what was happening <laughs> on Ipswich Railway Station. I don't think that's going to be an explanation ever. So what, we can, what, what, do, what do we know from this? Um, we know if we look at the literature that actually you can think of laughter more like a different way of breathing than it is a different way of speaking. And actually, breathing in humans is really interesting. We breathe completely differently when we speak compared to any other animal. What we do is entirely because we walk upright. So what you're all doing right now is what's called metabolic breathing. Very important, don't stop. Okay, <laughs> gets air in and out of you, keeps you alive. What we do when we start to talk, we take a breath in. And then we use a very, very finely controlled flow of air, which you're actually producing by how we move the muscles that are intercostal muscles between our ribs. If I keep talking without taking another breath, you hear my intercostal muscles start to have to work really, really hard to squeeze the air out. One of these days, I'm either going to pass out or urinate when I do that demonstration. <laughs> no, we're good. So you're probably thinking, Sophie, that's interesting and slightly weird. Why did you do it? We can only talk at all because we can do this. This voluntary control over our breathing gives us the power for speech and song and everything we do voluntarily with our voice comes from this. And it's why other animals can't talk. They all need to use their forelimbs to support their weight. It means they need to use their intercostal muscles to support their weight and they cannot re repurpose the intercostal muscles in this way. We have as much fine control over our intercostal muscles as we do over our fingers and hands. That's how precise these movements are. Now, there is a mortal enemy of speaking and of breathing, and that's laughter. Because when you start laughing, those same intercostal muscles just start to do very large single contractions, just going, ooh, ooh, squeezing air out of you. Every single laugh sound, ha, ha, is just one of those exhalations. We don't really understand why, but it seems to be an involuntary behaviour very frequently, and that seems to overwhelm the voluntary stuff that you're using for talking. But it also seems to win over breathing. So when you start laughing, it stops you breathing, it stops you talking. It's just squeezing air out of you. It is trying to kill you. It's a relatively dangerous activity. And it can be extraordinary when you encounter somebody trying to get through both things at the same time, this involuntary and this voluntary behaviour. So a few years ago on the Today programme, James Nockerty was talking about an upcoming interview with Jeremy Hunt. And he got his name wrong and called him something else. And then there was this brief pause and he started talking about an upcoming WikiLeaks account. And he just sounded like he was having a fight with a big and sprightly pig. <laughs> and he was, except it was him. He was literally duking it out with his own intercostal muscles. And the laughter was winning. You knew there was definitely something happening. He said, I'm coughing. He was not coughing. He was laughing. <laughs> Incidentally, from a psychological point of view, he described that as a spoonerism, what he did. It wasn't a spoonerism. What he did was an anticipatory speech error. And actually, psychologists working in communication really like those because they tell us something about who are, how you're anticipating the sounds of speech when you're planning an utterance. So the error that he made was actually to do with, wasn't Jeremy Junt. It was an anticipatory one of other sounds coming up. 
And we like that because it tells us how you produce speech. We also kind of like it because it does suggest you think it's a little bit of a Jeremy Hunt. So you are <laughs> going on. Talking Jeremy Hunt's back in Ipswich Railway Station. Now, I get the joke. It's a really funny joke. You leant round me, you tapped me on the shoulder, I looked the wrong way. It's hilarious. But actually, laughter is not really very well explained by humour. We think it's about jokes and humour, but actually laughter primarily happens because other people are around us. It's primed by other people being there. You are 30 times more likely to laugh if somebody else is with you than if you're on your own. And you'll laugh more if you know them or you like them. It's all something you do based on social bonds. You do it a lot. You will laugh, even in a very boring conversation when you've come in to take part in a psychology experiment, you laugh about seven times for every 10 minutes of conversation, which is a lot of a non-verbal expression of emotion. And we've recently collected data from friends having conversations showing that on average, friends spend on average 10% of the whole time of a conversation laughing with each other. So it's less to do with jokes and more to do with who you're with and how you feel about them. So we think about Ipswich Railway Station. Those young men were having a whale of a time with their lovely social bond. Why didn't I just go, hooray? Lovely. Well, well, congratulations, gentlemen. That they didn't, I, didn't, I was like, oh, I hate you all. There was a brief period where if they'd all fallen under a train in a sort of mix of tangled skinny jeans and baseball caps, I'd have been okay with that, very briefly. <laughs> so why? Why is that? Well, because it's a social behaviour and we're social mammals. This stuff matters. The most important stuff on our horizons is other human beings and how they feel about us and how they're disposed towards us. We're always trying to assess it. We're always trying to work it out. So to give another example, a few years ago when my son was very small, small enough that you needed to squire him to the toilet. So I was in a restaurant. He wanted to go to the toilet, so I took him to the toilet. And we go into the toilet, he has a wee. And then I thought, oh, I'll have a wee as well. You know, I'm here. A lot of wee in this talk, sorry. But it's, okay. So, as soon as I sat down on the toilet, because he's two and a half, he unlocked the door. They do this. More surprisingly, somebody immediately opened the door, like she was waiting for the door to be unlocked. And this woman looked in, and I was like, yes. And she said, oh, don't worry about me. I just want to be sick. <laughs> Let's close that door and lock it again. Finish what we're doing here. Open the door. She, I came out the toilet. She waited. Fine, great. Wendy was sick. I'm like, okay, fine. Now, I live quite near where I work, and the restaurant was near both of these places, so I see her quite often. She's like waving at me, like, hi. I was like, I'm really confused. Did we, are we friends now? Is this, is this all it takes? Right, there. On Ipswich Railway Station, I was not confused. I didn't think those young men are having a lovely time, and I bet they'd like it if I joined in with their laughter. I knew the role I was playing in this. And it's because it's such an important aspect of our social interactions laughter. It really matters. And it matters as well because it's older than us. We find very recognisable laughter being used in very recognisable ways in other apes, but we even find it in rats. Rats laugh when they're playing. The scientists working with this wanted to know, is it laughter? So they started tickling the rats. The rats make the same sound when they're being tickled. That could, in theory, be the rats going, just stop it, I don't like it. So they get a rat used to being tickled and then just put their hand in to the cage and the rat will make the sound when it's trying to get a tickle out of you. And it turns out if the same researcher tickles the same rat every day, they make that sound when they see you coming into the lab in the morning. And I think scientists with me will agree. Pe scientists, people aren't normally that pleased to see us in the lab in the morning. So it's kind of someone cares. There's a rat out there that cares. Now, scientifically, <laughs> we know, scientifically, the best place to tickle a rat is the nape of the neck. Useful information, I think, for everybody there. But <laughs> not on Ipswich Railway Station. I think I'm not going to try and tickle these boys. I think that's going to make things worse, if anything. I think that's going to, you know, not turn things well around for me. What I did instead was I took a scientist's revenge. And I wrote that story up in a peer-reviewed publication. <laughs> Probably number 376 in all of the laughter papers. And the next time those teenage boys pick up the December 2014 edition of Trends in Cognitive Neurosciences, <laughs> they'll be laughing on the other sides of their faces. <laughs> Thank you very much.